All right. Uh, it's so good to see everybody here today and so many familiar faces. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Simona Tatcha. I'm the director of the Office of Science and Technology at the Austrian Embassy in Washington, D.C. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today also on behalf of Annette Weber, who's the press secretary of Minister Fassmann, the Minister for Education, Science and Research. We're here today on the occasion of the publication of the autobiography of Nobel laureate Professor Martin Karplus. The publisher is World Scientific, and we have some representatives here as well today. Thank you for joining us. And the very fitting title is Spinach on the Ceiling, a theoretical, uh, the life of a theoretical chemist. And uh, as you've probably seen as well, the autobiography is illustrated with over 200 photos, and many of them are in color. What I love most about my role at OSTA is that uh, I get to engage with brilliant scientists, brilliant Austrian researchers like Martin on a daily basis. And we do that through RENA. RENA is Austria's network that supports scientists, innovators, and entrepreneurs who are in North America. And that is how I met Martin several years ago. Um, and I've since found out in conversations that he's not only a brilliant researcher, but that he's also an inspiring artist. His culinary passion was sparked very young when he was spending time in the family's kitchen with back then their maid. Um, and his love for photography was triggered by a PhD present that he got from his parents. Um, they gave him a Leica 3 camera and Martin took the camera with him on travels um, wherever he went to do his research. And as you can imagine, a young student finds a lot of photo opportunities wherever he goes in the world. Um, Martin and I recently spoke about where life has taken him. And he tells me that none of us embarks on our journeys in life alone. We don't become excellent at what we do without help. And for him, that help has come from his students. They've been, in his opinion, key to his success. Um, he shared with me that students often took a problem, a challenge, and they went with it. And it turns out that in the end, they often came up with results and solutions that were even better and more than what Martin at that point had hoped for. For Martin, building a community of students means mentoring them. And he still does that very passionately today. The Nobel Prize in Chemistry that he earned in 2013 leaves us no doubt about his success in research. Um, today, Martin is 90 years old and he's still working hard to solve problems that we face in today's world. Um, I think perseverance and his thirst for discovery has never left him because he's still very eagerly talking about um, working on finding a vaccine for HIV and also, I think, Martin, a rare form of influenza. And he told me uh, that he doesn't want to lean back. Um, he loves his research and he's doing what he's doing because he's eager to give back to the world that helped him or that helped make him who he is today. With that, it is now my pleasure to welcome Professor Martin Karplus. Theodore William Richards Professor of Chemistry Emeritus at the Harvard University's Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology. Martin will share some remarks with us now, and then I'll open the floor for your questions. Thank you, Martin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Let me begin by thanking you, Simona, for organizing this press conference, and you, the reporters, many of which I have already met before, for attending. Why did I write this autobiography? First, to inspire young people, particularly students in the sciences, by showing them that I met difficulty in, in my work and that the faith I had in myself permitted me to overcome them. A case in point is the research which led to the Nobel Prize. Can people understand me? 
Yes, we can hear very well, Professor Kappas. The, the case in point is that I propose to extend studies that I had made in the early 60s of the simplest chemical reaction, a hydrogen atom reacting with a hydrogen molecule. And I thought that it might be useful to try to use the same methods that we had used for that to study much larger molecules, proteins and DNA, which may have thousands of atoms. And when I proposed this, my chemistry colleagues said, we can't really understand molecules with more than about five or six atoms. You must be crazy to try to use this method for thousands of atom molecules. And my biology colleague said, well, even if you could be do, do this, we wouldn't be very interested. Well, I persevered. And as history has shown, that in the Nobel Prize, I suppose, is evidence for that, that they were wrong and I was correct. And this faith in myself is one thing that keeps me going. And um, as Simone already said, continuing to do research. Now, a second reason I wanted to write the autobiography is to bear witness to future generations of what happened when the, in Austria under the Nazis. As Mayor, then Mayor Heupel said when he inducted me as a, an honorary citizen of Vienna, let me read this. We, we cannot undo what happened, but we will do the best to not let it happen again. And the third reason I wanted to write it, I wanted just to remind myself of how lucky I was to be where I am today and to pass this on to my family. Now, if I have a few more minutes, I'll read a few passages from my autobiography. Please do. Of course, this is the, the question where the title comes from. Then there was the infamous Spinach incident. Mitzi, our maid at the time, told me that I must eat my spinach. Popeye did not exist in Austria, but unfortunately spinach did. With all the vehemence I could muster, I took a spoonful of the spinach and threw it at the ceiling. The spinach stain remained visible on the ceiling for a long time and was pointed out at appropriate moments when my parents wanted to indicate what a naughty child I was. Now the second I want to quote goes back to when uh, my extended family, 20 or so people who were related to, to us in one way or another used to spend the summers either on a lake in Austria or on the Adriatic. And this, these large family gatherings were very important in my future in giving me a feeling of belonging. Now, what I wanted to read was that uh, one day when I was a, a, a toddler, but I, I was speaking and such. One day at the beach, a friend of my parents picked me up and cuddled me, much to my dismay. I yelled out, Ich bin ein Nazi, I'm a Nazi, which so shocked her that she dropped me. 
Clearly, I had somehow realized, presumably from listening to my parents and others, that being a Nazi was the worst possible thing to be. Now, as uh, Simona has already mentioned, one of my interests is in uh, cooking. And I managed to cook in many of the famous three-star restaurants in France and Spain. And this is one which was uh, one of my best experiences, was it working for Joël Robichon, who was the star, three-star chef, three star chef of his generation. At my, as my stage was nearing the end, it had been so special that I thought it would be nice to finish by having a lunch there with Marcy, my wife. I waited to request a reservation until a few days before. So not surprisingly, when I asked the maitre d, he said that he was very sorry, but the restaurant was fully booked. However, he came back a little while later and said he had managed to find a table for us, presumably because Robichon had intervened. Marcy had arrived from Strasbourg by train that morning, and we were ushered to a well-situated table with a bottle of champagne and a cooler waiting for us. Marcy's menu did not have any prices. This was not unusual in itself, Usually in elegant restaurants, there was no price on the guest's menu. But what was surprising was that, uh, that in my menu, the prices were not listed either. I pointed this out to Marcy and asked her, what should I do? She said, well, it's pretty clear to me what is going on. Robichon is inviting us. It was a wonderful and gracious luncheon, at the end of which the maitre d' escorted us to Robichon's private sitting room, where we had coffee and cognac with him and chatted for a while. After we returned to Strasbourg, I sent him a special bottle of Eau de Ville de Poix pear brandy, for which Alsace was famous. And finally, as a final vignette, I will mention what sometimes happens when I'm riding in a taxi. One time, the driver turned out to have studied engineering in Nigeria. He was driving a taxi to earn money to support his extended family of 29 people. At the same time, he was going to night school to earn a master's degree in electrical engineering. The conversation turned to me and he asked me what I did. When I mentioned that I had won a Nobel Prize, he said what an honor it was for him to have me as a passenger. Similar reactions occurred almost invariably when I mentioned my Nobel Prize. This reinforces my feeling that the prize has given me an opportunity to do some good in the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, we will be opening the floor now for questions. Um, let's see. Uh, is there anybody who would like to ask the first question or should I begin with something? Let's see who we have here. Um, Peter Ilechko. Is there any, any questions from your end? I think uh, Christian Müller raised his hand before Simon. Christian Müller? Okay, I don't see that. Um, yeah, Christian, please I, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Hi. Hi, Martin. This is Christian Müller from the Austrian Press Agency, EPA. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity joining you in this press conference. And I have 
Actually, I have a very unqualified question. Uh, do you still don't like spinach? And have you ever cooked spinach when you were in these uh, famous uh, kitchens? And Martin, you're still unmuted. Professor Karplus, you're still on mute. If you could please unmute yourself. The button to the left at the bottom of the screen. Okay. There you go. Yes, we can hear you now. Uh, no, I've turned, it turns out I love spinach now. And we cook it almost once a week. Excellent. Christian, any follow-ups? No, he's muted. As a reminder, Christian, you're still muted. If you could please unmute yourself, thank you. Okay, thank you. Christian? Sorry. Yeah. Um, any follow-up? Yeah, maybe. Um, one one thing when I when I read your book, I have it I have it already, and 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 I, I really are impressed reading through it. Um, one thing which really surprised me is is this um, thing you you mentioned it several times that uh, you you always tried to work uh, to stop working in fields that you have understood. And, and focus on, on new and different areas, which is, in, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's very unusual in today's science because people are so much into it and, and, and in such small areas and, and, and uh, joining uh, and, and spending their whole life in uh, re doing research in, 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 in a very small area. And you jump from one area to another. Is How, how did you manage that? Is, well, the short of it is that uh, after a while, I felt I understood an area and became uninterested in it. And then I felt that if I went in an area where I didn't know anything about, I could have original ideas and make better contributions. This also was followed up by my plan that I sort of moved from one university to another every five years and had new colleagues who presented me these new problems. So it's just that it's really my excitement in doing something new that gave me the hope that I could do something original. Okay. Thank you. Um, any, any questions from anybody else, Peter? Hi, Martin. This is Peter from Vienna. Mm -hmm. We met uh, once in Harvard and in Vienna. Mm -hmm. uh, you said uh, once uh, the Austrians treat you like a rock star and you don't know why. How is it today? Well, I mean, it was sort of the thing that I had heard nothing from Austria for 75 years almost or whatever. And that uh, all of a sudden, I, you know, when I got the Nobel Prize, they uh, fed it me in so many different ways, as you know, and I described in the book. And uh, when everybody wanted to listen to me, I really felt like a rock star in making my presentations. I don't know, I've been back there where the things have changed. Okay. Martin, I have a question. Um, we spoke about this recently and that may be interesting to the journalists as well. Um, what is it that you would like young researchers to take away from, you, from reading your book, from reading the autobiography? 
what is the one thing that you want them to know for their own research careers going forward? Well, it's a little bit what I already mentioned why I wrote the autobiography. And that is that they should have faith in themselves. And if they have a good idea and somebody tells them, oh, it makes no sense, you shouldn't do it, they, they should uh, persevere in, in doing what they had proposed. Now, of course, sometimes they may be actually wrong, so they should listen to the people who are saying this, but they should make their own decision as to whether they think the subject is still worthwhile. Excellent. And what lessons, Martin, have you learned from the culinary arts and photography that you're applying or have been applying in your research career? Whether there's any connection between uh, uh, I think they're just uh, different. I mean, people ask me, you know, I'm a, you're a chemist. Does, uh, does your chemistry background help you in your cooking career? And my answer is no, they really don't intersect. I am not, uh, there are of course people who have written books about the science of food and such. Mm -hmm. I'm doing again, like in all these subjects, the sort of cre being creative on my own. And the, the, there's different photography is different from cooking and cooking is different from science. Excellent, thank you. Let me see if there is any other questions that I can take. Uh, yes, here uh, from Erina Ati, Moritz Wein, please. Hello, thank you uh, for the opportunity. Hello, Mr. Karplus, my name is Moritz Wein. I work for the Institute for Holocaust Education of the Austrian Federal Ministry of Education. Um, I have two questions, actually. The first one would be that um, at the moment we see a rise of anti-Semitism in Europe and also the United States. Do you have a, a message for young people in Austria um, concerning this phenomenon that anti-Semitism is at the rise again? You mean about the pandemic and such? No, about uh, that anti-Semitism is rising again. If you have a message for young people, how they should react or could react to the rise of anti-Semitism today? Well, I would hope, you know, as I mentioned, that they would take this lesson from uh, times ago and realize what the anti-Semitism can do to a country and hopefully would react against it. But I mean, it's, it's still there. That's why I must say I don't go back to Austria, but rather go to France, which is sort of my second home. Did you have another question? Yeah, my second, thank you, thank you. Uh, and my second question is, um, you were exposed from Austria. You fled Austria from the Nazis. Um, what is your relationship to Austria today? Well, as I just sort of mentioned at the end of my last comment, it's very distant. And uh, I was, you know, somewhat upset when Austria all of a sudden became interested in me when I won the Nobel Prize. And you know, a number of people, I was invited to various things and to the, be a member of the Austrian Academy of Science and so on. And when I was invited, the, the people asked me, given my history 
in Austria. What happened to us that we had to leave, we were the lucky ones, of course, thanks to my parents. What was, would I be willing to accept these honors? And again, is sort of the theme that's come up before in the questions in my writing. The theme is, yes, I will do it because I feel it is important for the young people to see somebody like me and realize what can happen if um, anti-Semitism isn't under control. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Moritz, as well. Um, any other questions? Um, just looking here to see if I'm missing anybody. Martin, you have recently, earlier this year, celebrated your 90th birthday. Um, and I mentioned that you're still actively engaged in your research because you just love what you do, and to you, it's not work. Um, what is the secret to keeping passion for your work up for all those years? Um, I know that you've changed every five years from one specialty to another, um, but... Well, I mean, basically, it's, it's all, I always see something new that I don't understand, that I want to do it and you know as uh, my wife says yes i'm an emeritus professor but i work um, you know continuously and actually now with the uh, uh what's happening in the united states we have uh, com basically confined to living at home and just taking walks around the neighborhood. But still, we, we all set up to continue to do research. And that's, that's, what's, that's what keeps me young, if you like. So yeah, when you get to be 90 years old, you sort of begin to forget things a little bit. But doing something new, is I think the important most important thing, which has been you know has come up before, but that's what keeps me going. Excellent, wonderful, thank you. So if there is no, I there is another question, Christian Müller, please. Hi, uh, this is Christian again. Um, I just wonder. I don't know if you know this, Martin, but Simone said already, uh, also that somebody of the publisher of World Scientific is, is on board. Uh, so maybe this person can answer my question. Is there already a, a publisher for, the, for a German version of the book? Madeline or Sue, do you want to take that question? Uh, Madeline, uh, would you... Um... Yes. Uh... Hello, um, I'm Madeline. Um, I'm doing the marketing for for the German uh, or German speaking region, and uh, we are looking in, into translation rights both for uh, German and French versions of the book, and especially with the media attention and, of course, um, uh, yeah, the the book um, being. Like widely acknowledged, uh, we we are hoping to um, yeah, realize this soon um, after the book is published. I'm going into talks with publishers from both uh, sides, German speaking as well as French. Yeah, but that would be that would be great. And uh, as I understand it, the book now is available uh, as a Kindle. And in August, it will come out uh, the pa the paperback and hardcover will be then yeah. available. So first, uh, on, on exactly Professor Kaplis on um, 
but it's now available on Amazon, the ebook first, and from uh, 13 July, uh, the print book is available on Amazon and in bookstores from mid of August, oh, end of July, 31st of July on Amazon and, and mid of August in bookshops worldwide. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you, Madeline. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, so we have reached the end of our time. We want to stick to the 30 minute press conference that we had announced. Um, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to reach out to me and I'm either trying to answer it or get you in touch with whoever is able to answer it, either World Scientific, the publisher or Professor Martin Karplus directly. Um, we will also be sending out a recording of this press conference also to share with those that were unable to make it today. Uh, due to scheduling conflicts. And um, what we can also offer you is uh, we'll be collecting um, all the press reports uh, and articles in the media and sharing those with all of you as well in the coming days. Um, as Martin right. has said, yes, Martin? I just wanted to have uh, the person who the details about what would be published when send an email to me so I know that I know this because I didn't know it before and she has much more detailed dates of what is going to happen. And of course, if there were a translation into German or French, that would be great. It would require people with um, both being able to write and understanding the science, but I certainly would be willing to help and read what, what comes out before it's actually published. Perfect, excellent. And it's wonderful news that the book is out today on Amazon for the electronic versions. Um, and in about three weeks time, we'll have the option to order your autobiography online as a hard copy. Um, thank you so um, much. Also, on behalf of the Ministry for Education, Science and, Science and Research, and the Oster Washington for joining us today. And again, please feel free to reach out to me should you have any additional questions. Thank you. Sorry, Simona, can you hear me? Sorry, Simona, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you, Eva. I've, I've, been, I've been trying to ask a question, and I, I, never, I always got muted, and I had no idea whether you could hear me. Do you think I could just ask one additional question? Yes, please, because I wasn't able to get through, get through the four. I'm sorry about this. No, um, hello, Martin. This, this is Eva Stanzel. I am the science editor of Wiener Zeitung in Vienna, and we have met once in New York a few years ago. Um, and I read in the preparation that you are working on a, an influenza vaccine for the Gates Foundation. Now, I was wondering, how far have you got along with this vaccination? And how do you estimate the chances that we will soon find a vaccination against the current co coronavirus? Do you think you could just give me a scientific roundup on that? Uh, well, the answer to the first question is that we are, we have finished the design of the antigens to be used and they have been shown to be stable and elicit antibodies. And now we're just getting ready to work with one of our experimental collaborators to try them in mice and ferrets, which is the next uh -huh. step when the vaccine actually would be available. And that also sort of goes into the second question is obviously quite a while because tests will have to be done on its efficacy in human beings and that it's not harmful. And, and that will take maybe another year or two. And so when uh, our president in his usual way, mainly telling lies rather than truth, says we'll have a vaccine tomorrow, or that the virus is going to disappear. I think, although there are many people, in fact, there are about a thousand people who are filing patents 
for vaccines, but it will still take um, a minimum of another year, even if it's fast-tracked for it to be available. So mm -hmm. we will you know, mm -hmm. be subjected mm -hmm. to the coronavirus uh, mm -hmm. for, unfortunately, much longer than uh, you know, he's, our president states. So mm -hmm. One funny thing that I don't know about, whether it's applicable or not, but when there was uh, the flu epidemic, you know, in 1918, it all of a sudden disappeared. Nobody exactly knows why. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's a hope that the coronavirus, after it sort of uh, killed a very large number of people, as in the flu pandemic, will disappear. Mm -hmm. I think about this. There's no reason to believe it, but maybe that's one hopeful sign. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you very much. And when will, will you have the influenza vaccine? Yes, Do you have thank the time you, scale on that as well? Did we miss anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. So. Hello? Yeah. Simona, you're muted. Hello? Yes. Hello? I, I cannot hear anything at the moment, and I don't know who's muted. This is still Eva. Eva, if you could perhaps uh, repeat your question, we didn't acoustically understand you just now. Okay, okay, right, I can understand. I'm just wondering when the, uh, the influenza vaccine will be ready. Is this going to be another year or two as well, or much longer? Well, it, it may be ready, mm -hmm. but in, if everything goes according to plan, and probably a year and a year and a half or something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much, Martin. Excellent. All right, let's see if there's any other questions. Not that I see. All right, well, let me thank you all again for joining us today. Martin, thank you for your time and sharing insights into your life and into the autobiography that you wrote. And I look forward to seeing everybody else again soon, hopefully for the upcoming ERIT that we will host virtually this year, uh, early September, and we'll be sending out information on that soon. All right, thank you so much. Thank you.